Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I am uh, Michael Zentev, and I will be your host and moderator today. And thank you for joining us for this long range colloquium organized by the Virtual Science Forum. If this is your first time joining us, I will put some information about how to join our group and the efforts we lead in the chat. And then let's uh, move to, to today's colloquium, which uh, will be presented by Giuseppe Carleo. Um, Giuseppe is, uh, is a friend and collaborator, and uh, he's a computational quantum physicist um, with a main focus on the development of advanced numerical algorithms to study challenging problems involving strongly correlated quantum systems. Um, Giuseppe is best known for introducing machine learning techniques to study equilibrium and also non-equilibrium properties based on uh, neural network representations of quantum states and for a time-dependent variational Monte Carlo method. He earned his PhD in condensed matter theory from uh, CISA and Trieste in 2011. And then he was a postdoc at the Institut d'Optique in France and ETH Zurich, where he also served as a lecturer in computational quantum physics. In 2018, he joined the Flatiron Institute um, at the Center for Com Computational Quantum Physics, the CCQ at, of the Simons Foundation in New York where he was a research scientist and project leader and also the leading developer of the open source project NetCat. Since September last year, he has been an assistant professor at EPFL in Switzerland, leading a research group focused on computational quantum science. And today he will tell us about uh, many body wave functions in the era of machine learning and quantum computing. So without further ado, Giuseppe, whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Uh, for this uh, <clears throat> for this very nice introduction and uh, uh, thank you also for organizing this uh, this colloquium. I'm uh, really um, excited to be here uh, today. Uh, and um, uh, so, in this presentation, I will give you um, an overview essentially of uh, how to um, emerged or emerging technologies, if you want, uh, such as uh, machine learning. Uh, and quantum computing, where machine learning is more emerged than quantum computing, um, are transforming the way also we, we study many body physics, or we, uh, we, we interpret or we use many body wave functions in, uh, to study physics or even chemistry. Okay. So just to uh, set up the, the general, uh, um, if you want, uh, background for my talk, uh, so let's first uh, deal uh, uh, with what we would like to, to address here. Um, it's a very general problem, infamous problem, the quantum many body problem. Um, and as you know, the, the, the thing that we would like to do here is really studying the, the properties of interacting particles uh, that these appear uh, pretty naturally when studying uh, you know, chemistry, material science, and uh, all sorts of, uh, of other systems where in strong interactions uh, play uh, a fundamental role. Uh, but also, I mean, this, uh, this, uh, this phenomena, this many body phenomena are also important. Uh, and, uh, um, it's important to understand them also when you, would, when you want, for example, to devise even quantum devices that exploit this, uh, uh, for example, entanglement and many body correlations to, to study or even solve some hard computational tasks. So in general, what you'd like to do is really to study these many body um, uh, quantum uh, phenomena. Uh, and the, the main problem, uh, as, uh, as we all know here, uh, is that uh, the origin of, uh, of, uh, of the challenge in describing these many body interacting systems is the fact that we have uh, a monster in, in the room. This is uh, what uh, actually uh, the famous uh, um, Nobel laureate Walter Cohn defined actually a monster, a high dimensional monster, which is the many body wave function. So in general, if you have let's say for simplicity, the many body wave function of spins, like let's say I have n spin one half particles. The problem here is that uh, you have to specify at least in principle to the n coefficients to even uh, to, to exactly specify all the properties of the system. So this is a, an insane, if you want, amount of information that in principle you have to store in order to, to be able to exactly predict if you want all the properties of the, of the wave. So this is the, the main issue, the fact that we have this exponential complexity. And as a result of this issue, as you know, solving uh, fundamental problems, for example, the, um, the Schrodinger equation, the time independent or time dependent one, 
um, is an intrinsical exponential arc path. So because this vector here, if you want, is exponentially large. And uh, even though if typically, uh, as a result of physical interactions, you can show that most Hamiltonians are have these sparsity properties, but this is typically not enough to, to be able to solve them exactly for, let's say, a typically large material they are, they are interested in. So, and uh, as a result of, of, this, uh, of this complexity, uh, the, the number of qubits, or if you want the number of spins or the number of electrons with functions you can, um, you can, you can store typically on, on a classical computer is very limited. Uh, and you can see that in, uh, in about uh, 50,000 years of, of history, essentially, the amount of qubits, if you want, you can store on, on available uh, technology to, to the humankind has increased very much. Um, essentially, we, we went from 10 to 50 uh, in uh, by going by analog to digital technology, but still, you see, uh, because of the amount of information, even if you use all uh, the BEM on, you know, on Summit, one of the largest supercomputers nowadays, this would allow you even just to store the wave function of more than 50 qubits. So this is a real bottleneck, so this uh, nominal uh, exponential complexity. However, there is a very nice, uh, I think, uh, uh, way around. It's not, of course, a generic uh, solution to, to, to this issue, but it's uh, one of the most powerful, I would argue, um, uh, way around that we have nowadays to, that we, we've had for, for some years, but nowadays it's becoming more, I would say, powerful ways of going around this problem. And so this, this way around is based on variational representation. So the main, uh, if you want, uh, insights so or the main uh, uh, concept that, that uh, on which all these variational methods are based on is that even though it's true that uh, a genetic state lives in this Hilbert or vector space like uh, the one I, I described before, so these are you know, exponentially complex. Uh, however, it's also true that we, are, we don't care about random states in this Hilbert space, right? So we want very specific states that are not random. They are solutions of uh, you know, physical equations. So they are solution of the uh, Schrodinger equation of some you know, lean lab, why, why not master equation if you have a density matrix and, and so on. So these are very specific, very structured states that, that if you want that we would like to, to study. Um, and uh, as a result, what we can try to do, and this is a very old if you want, uh, idea, we, we can try to parameterize my, my vector, my, my wave function with some parameters that here I'm calling W. This can be thousands, millions, if you want, or just one. If you, uh, if you don't want to use many. But the idea is that by, by changing these parameters, we can try to explore to, to somehow cover this space of physical states as much as possible. So, so if you want, uh, the, the, the basic idea of operational potential is, is very easy, is that by changing these parameters, we can try to span this class of interesting variational states. Now, traditionally, so how do we find these, uh, these variational states? Well, traditionally, it happens that uh, physicists are very ingenious uh, and have devised a lot of, of uh, very interesting variational wave functions. So I'm just listing here um, some of the most famous, like Laughlin states, uh, the beta wave function, Jasper wave function, BCS wave function. So most of them uh, led to Nobel prizes uh, accidentally. Uh, I mean, not, not accidentally, but uh, because they give uh, in intrinsic insight into very important problems such as superconductivity. Uh, or you know, topological properties uh, or interacting properties in 1D and a lot of other interesting things. However, as you can see, these are, and I try to depict those as like punctual uh, point-wise entries in this um, large set of physical states, in the sense that if you, for example, are interested in solving a generic Hamiltonian uh, that goes, for example, beyond uh, the, the 1D integral properties, uh, so it cannot be solved for better answers. With better answers, uh, it's clear that um, uh, these answers wave functions are typical device to solve very specific model Hamiltonians, for example, the BCS one. So they are in, in this sense, even though extremely important to, for the understanding of physics, they are limited in flexibility. Okay, so they really allow you to solve point-wise Hamiltonians in this space of, uh, if you want, physical Hamiltonians or physical states. Uh, however, I mean, a great, uh, I would say like one of the most uh, important uh, innovations that happened right in the 90s by, by Steve White was the idea that we can generalize these in, in, a, in, a, in a systematic way and have wave functions that uh, are expandable so that they can cover at will uh, to some extent this space of physical states. Okay? 
So for example, the, the most famous, one of the most famous variational states is that these properties are matrix polar states introduced by Steve White. And you know that if I'm in one D and I have a low end tag on the state, uh, you can show that uh, the wave function and these are written uh, typically in a compact way in terms of products of matrices in this form. Okay. So, and this was really like, I would say the first time where we had this insight into the fact that by increasing, for example, this bond dimension of these matrix sites, we can cover more and more states. So this was really a fundamental idea in the field. And uh, this um, is- Giuseppe, uh, can I interrupt you quickly for, for a question by, by Stephen? Stephen, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask the question directly. If I quickly could. So the uh, ANSATs or uh, special uh, collections of functions, are those affine subspaces or in general manifolds of the underlying Hilbert space? Um, yeah, these are, I would say these are manifolds, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there, there's, there's non-linearity embedded in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will give you some specific examples. In a, in a okay, super, thank you. Um, but uh, so, so the, the, there have been, of course, generalizations of, of these tensor networks ideas, not only to 1D, but also to higher dimensions. Um, and for example, PEPS, uh, MERA, and uh, other, other, other tensor networks representations. And these typically are, are uh, pretty good, especially in 1D, are capturing area low states. So states that satisfy the area law of entanglement. Uh, however, there are cases where, you know, describing a high dimensional system, for example, a volume of states that are relevant for, for example, uh, um, long time dynamics or high temperature states, these are, have proven more challenging for this kind of representations based on, um, on, on tensor networks. So it would be ideal uh, to, to, to try to, to find those other representations that can complement, if you want, those, these uh, tensor networks uh, representations. So what, uh, what we did uh, now uh, four uh, years ago or so was to introduce the representations of this new, of wave function that is based on the neural networks. Okay. So this is what I call uh, neural uh, quantum states that we introduced uh, with Matthias Stoy in this paper. And um, uh, yeah, just coming back to the previous question, this is a truly non-linear, if you want, parameterization of, of, of these functions, if you want, of these complex value functions which are uh, the wave functions. Uh, and what you see here is just a very complex way of mathematically writing down uh, what happens in a deep network. So deep networks are the work horse um, uh, for the, um, the, the power horse for, the, for, the, um, uh, for, for machine learning these days. Um, and uh, essentially what happens is that these deep networks are nothing but a, a composition of linear and nonlinear transformations. So for example, if you want to represent the, the, the amplitude of the wave function for a given set of quantum numbers, let's say you begin at spins here, uh, then what you do is that you start with this vector of quantum numbers, Z, so it's now on the right, you apply a linear transformation, this, this W is now really a matrix, uh, and then you apply component wise, so like really to all the components of this vector, a nonlinear function G. Then you apply linearity, nonlinearity, and so on until you reach the last layer. So you see, I, I do this operation L times, and the, the number of times I do this is called the number of layers, if you want, in this network. And modern days deep networks are called deep because they typically have, you know, they can have even hundreds of layers uh, and these nonlinearities. Okay. Now, uh, coming back to the physics, I mean, if you want, uh, we know a, a lot of, by now, a lot of interesting uh, properties of these neural network states. Um, so one is more general, actually, and is inherited from the general literature in, in uh, of machine learning, if you want. And we know by um, essentially from the work of Komogor, and now not the pre-machine learning, but extremely related to, this, uh, to these functions, that uh, any i-dimensional function, so in this specific case also with functions, can be written in the form of a neural network, essentially, of two-layer neural network. So this is the result of Komogor and Arnold. Um, that, that is called a universal approximation theorem in the sense that in principle, in principle, it exists a neural network that represents an arbitrary wave function. Okay? Now, the catch is that typically the, the non-linear function that you can see here, so this phi and the small phi, are typically hard to compute. So this is, uh, this is where the, if you want, the exponential complexity gets back in. But at least in principle, this kind of representations uh, exist. Also, there is a, um, uh, there are more general if you physics-based arguments that have been derived in these this papers uh, that tell, tell us that um, if you have a deep network, you can efficiently encode, for example, volume law. Right? So if you have a long-range entanglement, uh, not only long-range co-locking, but also long-range correlations, 
um, then you can encode these efficiently. Efficiently means using a neural network of polynomial, uh, polynomial size, the correlations by, by increasing the depth. So essentially, if you scale the depth with the number of particles, then you can encode also long, encode long range correlations in your system, okay? which instead are typically harder to study if you have tens. Um, and also, I mean, we, we recently found uh, a mathematical connections, if you want, uh, strict connection between the tensor networks and the neural networks. So in this, in this paper, I will not go into the details of the mathematical, um, uh, if you want, the result, but uh, you can see them here. But essentially, it turns out that uh, an arbitrary tensor network can be written, uh, that can be contracted, so used efficiently on a, on a classical computer, can be also written efficiently where again, efficiently means using a neural network of uh, polynomial large number of neurons in the number of, of particles uh, into a neural network. So there's, a, 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 if you want a constructive connection to transform, for example, what you see here on the left, which is an MPS, a metric polar state, into a, a neural network whose weights are completely determined in terms of the, of the matrices of the, of the, of the MPS. Uh, so, I mean, as a result, if you want, of this, uh, of this uh, theorem of, I mean, of the color that I showed you before, we are also getting more intuition of what kind of states we can, we can represent exactly uh, with uh, these neural networks uh, using, again, not an exponentially large network, but possibly smaller one that we can handle efficiently. And uh, essentially, by now, we know that all, uh, for example, gap to one these states, uh, ground states can be written efficiently in terms of neural network states, all metrics polar states. Um, and uh, also all the PEPS states, uh, so PEPS are a generalization of MPS in two dimensions that can be contracted efficiently on, on a classical computer. Uh, so all of these quantum states can be written efficiently in terms of neural networks. Uh, and also, I mean, there is some, uh, as you see, there's some space to spur. And this is, these are these voluminous states that are typically instead uh, hard to write if you have a planar tensor map. Now, um, th these are some theoretical, if you want, quantum information uh, to a large extent properties of these, of these quantum states, of this parameterization, mathematical characterization. Um, but of course, in practice, we, we want to use them to, to solve some, uh, some real problem. Um, and so uh, we have used them to solve a lot of problems, so dynamics, ground states, uh, and uh, all sorts of other um, finite terms and other things. But today I will focus mostly on, uh, on learning the ground state properties. Okay, so really with the problem here is finding the ground state of a given interacting uh, many body Hamiltonian, which is you know, hard enough. Um, so, and in this case, uh, we, we honor the, the, you know, the standard variational principles. So essentially if I have a Hamiltonian, interacting Hamiltonian, I try to, what we do is that we minimize if you want the energy functional um, uh, as, as a function of these variational parameters uh, W. Okay. So this is what the mathematician called the Rayleigh quotient. Uh, it's just this variational expectation value of, of the Hamilton. Now, the, the crucial point is that we can rewrite, uh, that, that actually allows us to connect to machine learning. We can rewrite this quantum expectation value as a statistical expectation value over this distribution, which is the Born distribution, if you want, the, the probability density of, of associated with the, with the wave function. Uh, of an object that I'm not writing here, space that is called the local energy that depends only on the Hamiltonian. Um, so this means that by, by if you want, by sampling from, from the wave function, we can also estimate expectation values of, of this operator H. So we can transform, uh, a, a, if you want, a quantum problem into a statistical physics problem on this classical, if you want, probability distribution, which is psi squared. Now, uh, let, let me give you some uh, example application. Uh, so one uh, model which has been uh, somehow used a lot as a benchmark in, this, in our community is, um, is the case of, of frustrated magnets, okay? So, so if you take the J1, J2 model, so this is a prototypical example of fr frustrated magnetism in, in two dimensions, for example. So where you have uh, Eisenberg-like interactions on a square lattice with this interaction J1 on nearest neighbors, J2 on next to the nearest neighbors. And you know, this problem is uh, unsolved uh, because you can't use, uh, for example, quantum Monte Carlo, you can't use uh, tensor networks uh, uh, with the same degree of controllability that you have in 1D. Um, you can't use quantum computers to solve this problem uh, exactly. So it's really you know, a very hard uh, problem that we don't know how to solve exactly. So it's really a natural benchmark for new techniques, I would argue. 
And the open question here is essentially, uh, if uh, there is a spin leakage or disorder, if you want non-magnetic phase intervening uh, in the middle of, of this phase diagram where the J2 is of order 0.5 when compared to the J1. So this has been an open issue if you want in the, for this kind of things. Now, uh, if uh, we take a step back and we take, uh, first of all, the Eisenberg limit, so we, we remove this J2 term, so we put J2 equal to zero. Uh, this was uh, the first application that we did of our techniques to, as a benchmark for just the Eisenberg model into the, um, and you can see here that by increasing the, the, the network size, so this alpha was the, if you want, the width of uh, this, uh, this network, we could improve on the accuracy on the ground set energy systematically. You see that the, the, the error goes down, this is the error on the energy. Um, um, but I mean, recently by, by going deeper, so being able to use deeper networks, we, we've improved this um, also more and more. I mean, we saw some, uh, so this is, uh, if you want the slide containing all the, 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 if you want the, the evolution, I like to show this because it shows that it takes some effort, but at the end we can, we can improve things. Um, and you see that recently by using a significantly um, deeper network that what we could do it in these uh, you know, early applications, we, you can solve, for example, this Eisenberg model at almost exactly, I would say, with the variational uh, concepts, which is already a non-trivial case in this limit in which J2 is equal to now, if we go back to the, to the J2 finite, uh, so the state of things uh, as of, uh, of, of our paper in 2019 uh, was that uh, we, we could um, uh, improve uh, uh, some other existing techniques. So for example, you can see that the MRG, that despite being a 1D technique is, uh, is extremely powerful also for these 10 by 10, for example, class in two dimensions. Um, and you can see here the difference in energy between our approximation that is here is called CNN and these other things. So, so you can see that if our energies uh, lie in this, uh, in this part of this diagram means that we have a better if you want, energy or if they lie here, it means that we have a worse energy. And you can see that almost everywhere, I mean, with the notable exception of these two points that you can see here, um, these uh, deep networks were already able to, 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 to improve some of these, uh, of these existing uh, approaches. Now, as you can see, there are these two points that are a little bit have been, have been annoying for a long time uh, in the community because somehow pointed out to the fact that around this strongly faster regime, that, that, that there was a difficulty in the, in the network to learn if you want the ground state. And uh, it has been, um, this, this challenge has been analyzed. Uh, and there's, it has been uh, some, some reasons for this, for this uh, if you want, uh, um, less uh, you know, difficulty in learning this frustrated phases has been analyzed, if you want, also from a statistical physics perspective in this very nice paper. And uh, they, they, for example, what you can see here is that if you take a frustrated model, which is not exactly J1, J2 model I showed before, but similar, um, and you increase the frustration, so the frustration here increased by increasing J2 uh, also in this, uh, with this color, so as you can see. They show that the number of samples, so this axis is essentially proportional to the number of samples that you need to learn the ground state. Um, essentially, uh, you can see that when you, when you go deep into the frosted phase, also the number of samples that you need to learn these ground states with a good fidelity, so fidelity one means uh, I got it uh, exactly, also increases. And there is a very interesting a sort of phase transition at some critical number of samples that you need to see. So the intuition behind this is that if I am in a, in a, in a if you want, in an L order phase or in a scribed order phase or in some ferromagnetic order phase, also the number of measurements, if you want, of samples that I, I need to see from my wave function is much smaller if I want to learn the ground state than those that I have in a spin liquid phase. This is because typically here, I have a lot of, uh, you know, highly entropic phase with a, with a lot of different you know, structures. And this, uh, the fact that I need to use a lot of samples is reflected by, uh, again, by this lack of, of this slightly less precision in this, in this region of, of the first gap. And it's shown here where you see that this critical, if you want, number of samples changes by increasing the, 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 the amount of, of, uh, of frustration. Uh, however, I mean, uh, you know, we, we like improving things and uh, also other people in the community like improving things uh, um, independently. And this is the case, for example, of this ve very recent um, uh, work 
uh, in the group of, uh, of uh, Imada, Masatoshi Imada in, in, in Tokyo by Yusuke Nomura. Um, and uh, you can see here, so this is the, the infamous uh, 0.5 points So this uh, case here where we had the um, bad accuracy uh, in, the, in, the, in the initial states. But it turns out that if you impose, for example, translational symmetries uh, in, a, in a smart way, I'm not going into the, much into the details, but you can see that essentially also in this case, also in this very challenging um, point, now uh, the, the state of the art results from this model are obtained with this uh, neural net. So these RBM plus PP are just neural networks with some enforced symmetries. Okay? So I invite you to read the paper if you want uh, more details. So uh, the, 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 we, the way we, we used to, we, we can outsmart if you want this number of samples uh, problem is by using symmetries that allow us also to reduce uh, systematically the number of samples that we need to see in order to work the graph state efficiently. Now, um, another family of problems uh, that uh, has been, uh, that is uh, essentially, if you want, if you want the most interesting uh, problem we would like to solve when it comes to, to, to many body um, physics uh, are fermions, right? So I, I told you at the beginning that we want to start in principle the properties of materials, of, of molecules, so we need to deal with the problem of, um, if you want, enforcing uh, the, the most, one of the most fundamental symmetries that we have in, uh, in nature, which is uh, you know, the permutational symmetry in the, uh, for identical particles. Right? So when it comes to fermions, there are different ways of doing that with neural networks. So the way that I will describe now is what we did in, uh, in this paper, um, which is, you know, to some extent uh, um, naive and, uh, but, but uh, straightforward. Um, but the idea is that, uh, as you know, there are ways, uh, started by Jordan uh, and Wigner, to map fermions onto spins. Right? So if I have a generic fermionic Hamiltonian, I can map it to, into a spin Hamiltonian. So, so in this sense, without uh, permutational symmetries in the wave function. Um, and then I can use all the techniques that I've developed for spins to study also fermions. Okay? So this is what we did in this paper. Uh, and one th something which we did that is not usually done, if you want, in the condensed matter community, is that we adopted also other mappings. So maybe this is less known, but uh, there's not only one way of mapping fermions to spins. For example, there are many other ways. Uh, there is a famous mapping due by to, to, to Bravi and Kidai, for example, and uh, they have different problems. So, for example, the Jordan Migrant mapping, the, the one you might be more familiar with, is essentially mapping of the fermionic operators into spin uh, raising and lowering operators through a, a sequence of, uh, of spins, if you want, of sigma z operators, right? So this is the it's fitted here. Uh, however, one of the problems of this mapping is that it gives rise to a spin Hamiltonian that is essentially, an, uh, that has interactions that are n body, right? Because you have these strings of operators that are uh, typically, in a sense, unphysical for the spin Hamiltonians, because you have a lot of, you are, you are also breaking the locality, if you want, of, of the resulting spin Hamiltonian. Uh, so there are smarter ways, if you want, of doing that. So one is doing um, is due by Bravi Kidaev, uh, and it's routinely used in um, in quantum computing. And uh, with, without going too much into the details of this mapping, but uh, you, you can show that you can uh, map these uh, CNC dagger operators uh, into, as you see here, a linear combination of sigma x and, uh, and the i sigma x. Um, um, uh, with some operators A and B, so you have a sandwich of operators A and B, but these are A and B operators are quasi-local. So quasi-local means that instead of involving uh, N spins, like in the case of uh, typical Jordan linear strings, they involve only typical log N strings. Okay? And this construction, which is um, non-trivial, is based on, on the ideas that instead of representing the sign of, of, of when you exchange two particles as a product, you instead use a tree to represent this, uh, this, uh, the change in sign whenever you, you exchange two particles. So this is one of the mappings that we use also to, to do this kind of uh, transformation to spins. Uh, and we've used this, uh, this kind of, of methods to, for example, study some simple, I have to say, problems uh, in chemistry. So these are, for example, dissociation curves uh, for um, a couple of uh, the atomic molecules, so C2 and uh, D2. Um, and uh, so, so what you can see here is the energy as a function of the nuclear separation for these uh, two atomic molecules. So this is C2 and, uh, and C2. And, um, um, our results that again are obtained with a very simple uh, one layer uh, neural network, this RBM wave function, uh, are in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in green here. So these stars. 
Uh, and you can see that one can typically reach very high curves, so the level almost of uh, full CI, so the exact result in this case, uh, on this uh, basis set that you pick when you discretize your, your space. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Can, I, can I quickly interrupt for another uh, question that just popped up? Uh, Annabelle, do you want to ask yours yourself? Otherwise, I can also look at it. Yeah, sure. Hi, Giuseppe. Um, I was wondering, could you also do something in principle to simulate spin full fermions? So, sorry, say, say that again. Spin? Could you also do spin full fermions? Because, I mean, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, sorry, here I consider the simple case in which I have spinless fermions, but this is easily generalized to, to spin full fermions. You will just need the, to. Um, yeah, so, so you, you double your degrees of freedom in a sense, but it's, uh, it's straightforward in a sense. Um, indeed, I mean, uh, yes, so th this is what we do here, actually. Uh, and uh, um, so, so um, it, it, and, and you can see, I mean, that for, for example, I mean, on these small basis sets, you can also to, um, you can improve, I mean, you can solve, I mean, improve some of the, of the issues that you have with some, uh, um, for example, couple castle with three plus uh, at large distances, which is strongly for the regime in this case. Um, and uh, we, we managed to get also nice dissertation energies in this case. Um, I would like to mention though that uh, this, uh, this method uh, uh, is not the only one actually, by, by, by far is not the only one you can use to, to study fermions, for most notably in chemistry. There is an alternative uh, set of approaches that uh, other people have, have introduced uh, and uh, are using also based on neural networks. Um, and these are based on uh, what are called the neural network backflow transformations. So um, just to give you the gist of, of this idea. So what you do is that um, you take a, a determinant if you want of orbitals, okay? so this phi now, uh, that instead of being a sim simple if you, want, uh, um, uh, if you want single particle orbitals, for example, this could be orbitals in momentum space, right? okay, depending on, uh, on the momentum and on the, on the spin coming back to your question, Annabelle, um, you, you can extend these and make this backflow transformation, which was inspired by the backflow uh, method of Feynman, um, and make these orbitals actually many body. Okay, so now they will depend not only on this uh, on the coordinate of the of this particle, but also on all the other particles through a function phi here that is uh, um, sorry eta here uh, and phi that that, that, that is permutationally uh, uh, invariant. Uh, so, so you can show that if you do that, you can describe essentially the most general wave function, a fermionic wave function in continuous space. So this is shown, for example, in this paper. Uh, and this, this has been used, uh, if you parameterize these objects, in neural networks also to study chemistry. And you can see in, uh, in a very nice paper uh, from, from these people in, from, uh, from NASA in 2021, um, so very recent, where they, 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 they study, again, this is now the continuous space Hamiltonian. so you are already in the limit of the continuum, you don't have a discrete basis like we had before, but you can see that even for, uh, I would say, traditionally challenging uh, molecules like neon or uh, other, uh, other molecules that you can see here, uh, with this, uh, uh, what, what, what is called the Ferminet, so this approach that was introduced by uh, these uh, Google people here in this paper is called Ferminet and improved in this paper um, uh, with DMC, with that technical details, but essentially, you see that you typically get results that are very close to the experiment. So now this is, uh, these are the experiment essentially. Um, and you, you manage to improve uh, all the other uh, existing uh, um, variational methods that, that, were, uh, that they were employed for this kind of, of, of model. So, okay. Um, okay, now, um, at the beginning of my talk, I, I, you know, I promised that I would tell you also something about uh, uh, quantum, the other emerging, so in this case, so, so I would argue that, uh, especially if you look at this, machine learning uh, by now is an emergent technology. Okay? It has shown that it can be used really uh, in a powerful way to study many body systems. Of course, there's a lot to be done and uh, to be improved still, um, but I mean, to, to a large extent, I would say that some of the, of the, the ground work has, has been done and uh, it's shown also in this paper. However, there's also there's an emerging now, nowadays I would say technology, which is about using quantum computers, right? To solve the same problem we had at the beginning. So again, solving, for example, for the ground state of a given Hamiltonian uh, and so on. So what, what about this, uh, this uh, 
quantum computers, and so why we talk about uh, quantum variational representation. Right? So the idea here is that um, if you want, instead of having now uh, parameterization of the wave function in terms of uh, uh, weights, so this W matrices that I have in my neural network or any other classical variational state or tensor network, for example, on a quantum computer, what I have is that I have a circuit. Okay, so I have a quantum circuit that is uh, simplified here, it's simplified here with this U of theta that depends on a lot of parameters. So for example, these are the knobs of, of the gates. So these are the angles of some uh, rotation that I can make on the first qubit, on the second qubit and so on. So, so these are all controllable parameters in my circuit. Okay? Um, and uh, uh, this parameterized quantum circuit then defines a family, again, a, a, a manifold of wave functions that I can use to, to try to, to, to find the grounds of, for example, of a given Hamiltonian or solve other problems. So I have in all these kind of applications, a loss function that can be, again, uh, this is loss function as a jargon in machine learning, but you can think of this just as the energy. So this would be the expectation value of the Hamiltonian again. And, and you can minimize this, this time not on a, on a GPU, on a classical computer, but really on a quantum computer, this object to find, the, the, for example, the graph state, okay? uh, typically using uh, some gradient descent. Uh, and uh, the, the nice thing of this is that there is a strong connection between uh, all the techniques that, uh, that, uh, that, that have been developed in the classical world that are based on these stochastic approaches like machine learning and Monte Carlo methods to perform variational minimization uh, and uh, these quantum uh, methods that have been developed in the, in, the, in the quantum computing world. So for example, the variational Monte Carlo approach that I described before by, that is, was invented essentially by Mike Miller in the 60s. So this idea that we transform um, the, the quantum problem into a statistical problem, uh, essentially uh, is equivalent uh, largely to the, uh, from a mythological point of view, to the, to the, to the variational quantum eigen solver that is very popular these days and is used to, to find ground states using these circuits. In the sense that in both cases, you have stochastic evaluations of, of the energy, for example, and in both cases, you use uh, stochastic evaluations of the gradient to minimize your energy. Then there is uh, many other techniques. Uh, I, won't, I won't go too much into the details of this, but, uh, uh, but essentially, for example, also techniques used to do variational real-time evolution, imagine time evolution, they have uh, an analogous also in the, in the quantum uh, algorithm set. So for example, one of these techniques that we, uh, that we, 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 if you want, we brought to the quantum realm, but it, it was uh, very much uh, already existing in the classical realm uh, is uh, what, uh, what is called uh, as the natural gradient. So uh, the, the general idea of this natural gradient method is that if I want to minimize a loss function, so for example, my energy, so instead of performing a standard, uh, as, I, as I wrote here, if you want, uh, uh, gradient descent of optimization. So you see that here at each step, I update my parameters following the, 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 the gradient descent direction. Um, it's, it, it's best to, to use instead a metric that corresponds to the space in which I, I parameterize my wave function, for example, right? So in this metric tensor is, uh, is that is called G here, that's whose inverse I'm applying to the gradient, is crucial in transforming also the topology of the loss function and make it smoother in a sense. So I'm following with the direction that, uh, that makes more sense um, when I consider the parameterization of my manifold of wave functions. And it turns out that this, this, uh, this metric tensor uh, that takes this form here is, is, uh, is the quantum uh, official information matrix or the quantum genetic tensor. I mean, it has a lot of, uh, of different names. You just see the definition here. And uh, it, it turns out that uh, this can be measured also efficiently if you want on uh, on quantum hardware, uh, as uh, we also discussed in, in our paper here, um, uh, using a, a relatively simple quantum, uh, quantum hardware. Okay. Um, and uh, more recently, actually, we introduced a method to, to estimate this G matrix, so this uh, quantum geometric tensor, more efficiently. So, so uh, I'm not going too much into details, but the, the statistical, uh, if you want, the number of measurements that you will need to perform on a quantum computer to measure this is uh, quadratic in the number of parameters, so it doesn't scale really nicely. However, with uh, this recent development we did, which is called um, uh, the, the quantum natural SPSA, uh, with, uh, with the IBM people that uh, in Zurich that, that I listed here, uh, we showed how to make also this, uh, this thing uh, more efficiently run on an actual quantum computer and, and make it also, uh, if you want, more efficient to, to find ground states of some, uh, some interesting uh, Hamiltonians. It has been also 
recently demonstrated for, for chemistry applications um, by, by IBM. Um, and uh, okay, this was also another, another thing that I wanted to mention, which is about uh, simulating the dynamics on a quantum computer. Um, and uh, it's another quantum model that we, we discovered. So this is this other line here. So in the classical case, we had this time dependent version of Monte Carlo. This can be, if you want, brought to the quantum world. Um, and that's what we, we call projected uh, relational quantum dynamics. Um, but this was really just to give you an idea that uh, there is a strong connection between these two worlds that we are just starting to, uh, to explain. Okay, now maybe in the, in the last uh, few minutes, uh, uh, I wonder if you want to try to, to close maybe the, the, the circle and uh, go back to, to, to the first part um, and uh, try to, to understand essentially what are the limits of, uh, of classical uh, simulation uh, with respect to quantum computation, right? So, so what, I, what I told you is that uh, we, we typically are interested in studying the, the ground states or physical states. And uh, we, we do so either with classical wave functions, so for example, neural networks, uh, or with quantum wave functions, so with a quantum computer. However, I would say it's not entirely clear at this point, uh, at what point, you know, uh, a classical wave function is not enough to describe an interesting if you want, ground state, and you need the quantum uh, wave function in order to, be, to have more accuracy, um, if you want. Okay? So and in order to, to start trying to address this question, uh, it's important, for example, to show that you can simulate one model with the other one, right? So, so in this sense, that's the sense of this work that the, the, we do here. So essentially we try to simulate a quantum circuit using a classical machine. Because if you are able to show that classical, you can simulate a complex quantum circuit, then this would um, somehow suggest that uh, not all the quantum circuits uh, uh, can explore states that you cannot explore classically. So to put it uh, in this way. So in this sense, what we do in this uh, for this problem is that we try to, to approximate a quantum circuit. So you can see this as a, as a unitary dynamics, if you want. The simplest thing dynamics you can do is some unitary gates, local gates. And uh, there is, a, as you know, a set of universal quantum gates, for example, single cubic rotation, other gates, two cubic convolutional rotation. So this is the kind of gates that we take in, in our work. Uh, and uh, as we already showed in 2018, there is a way to, uh, to apply some of these gates, most notably, for example, these control Z rotations and these uh, entangling gates, uh, control Z rotations. Um, so these are single cubic rotations, these are control Z rotation, um, uh, exactly onto neural network. So for example, what I'm showing here is that if I have a wave function, which is a neural network, like this one, and I try to apply this gate on this qubit, you can show that there's an exact representation of this, uh, of the wave function after the application of the gate, also in terms of, of, of a neural network, slightly modified now. The same is true also for these entangling gates. The only, and uh, I would say most important gates for which we don't know how to do this, uh, this operation exactly, in the sense that uh, uh, we don't know how to write an, an exact neural network after the application of this gate is the Adama gate. Right? So this is an, an important superposition one cubic gate, but unfortunately at this point, we don't know how to write the exact action of the other on, 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 a, on, a, on, a, on a, my neural network wave function. So what we do here is that again, we use a variational approach if you want to simulate the action of the other So when, whenever we apply, we act on, on my variational state with the other we have another state phi in general, and we try to approximate the state phi with another neural network that in general will have different parameters that apply. Okay? And we do so by minimizing, if you want, the infidelity between uh, these two states. Okay. So this can be done again stochastically. I'm not going into the details, but it's written in this book. Um, and uh, um, so it turns out that uh, if you do this, uh, this operation, uh, you, you will pay the price that uh, at each time you have a Hadamard gate in your circuit, you will need to approximate it with variational. So you will introduce some infidelity in, in your circuit that you are simulating classical, right? And to some extent, this, is, this can be compared, I think it's legitimate to compare this to uh, the kind of error that you have on an actual quantum computer. So you know that if you have a quantum computer and you try to execute a digital quantum circuit, you, you cannot do that exactly either. Because uh, for example, whenever you try to apply Hadamard on an actual quantum device, this Hadamard is not implemented exactly in the, in the, in the analog, if you want, device that you have in the lab. But every time you apply the other one, you will have a finite fidelity. Okay? 
Uh, and also you will have uh, some decoherence and other sorts of noise that comes from the environment. So this means that uh, to some extent, uh, uh, you also pay uh, a fidelity price in the experiment. Uh, that is, that can be and should be compared, I would argue, to the fidelity price that we pay when we try to approximate the gate on the classical uh, simulation. Okay? So, and if you do this game, uh, for example, for some quantum field transform or other, other simple circuits, uh, you can show that the, the amount of, 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 uh, of fidelity that, that we have, for example, for these five by five circuits, um, for which we can still do some, uh, some uh, benchmark also for the exact calculations, is uh, comparable you know, to an effective noise level on the quantum barber, which is, you know, I would say, relatively small of 10 to the minus three. So, so the bottom line is that if you want to beat, uh, to, in this case, the, the accuracy that you have in the classical scenario, you need to have a quantum model which has a very, no, very low noise level at this point. Or you can do error correction, but this is not implemented yet in, in the quantum in any quantum model. Uh, and uh, with this approach, I mean, just uh, with this, I will finish. We simulated one, uh, one, uh, one, one typical one algorithm that has been uh, very um, popular this day, which is called QRA. This is an algorithm that is based on. Uh, um, on the idea that you, you can try to use a quantum computer to, to find the minimum of a, of a generic uh, cost function. Uh, I'm not going too much into the details of how this algorithm works, but you can see that it's pretty complex. It's been realized also experimentally by the Google team recently. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, with neural networks, we can go uh, actually at this point farther than what, what we can do experimentally by, I would say, still a large margin. We don't know how the experiment will evolve, of course, but. At this point in time, um, for example, we can simulate this algorithm for on um, uh, to, to some circuit depths and number of qubits that are not um, uh, reachable as far as we know with the existing uh, uh, technology. For example, so the connecting qubits with, with, with the same amount of fidelity that we have. So, for example, you can see here the, this is the cost function that emerges in this uh, in this uh, um, in this uh, QA uh, quantum quantum algorithm. Um, uh, that we can compare with the exact for, for p equal one, but so which is the depth of the circuit. But as, as soon as you make your circuit deeper, for example, you go to this p equal four, and when you start having uh, you know these these many gates, um, essentially this core that we predict here, uh, you know, we, we don't have essentially any other way of comparing it to to, to experiments because this is um, as far as we know in one of the first times this 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 so this deep circuit has been simulated classically or in general has been executed, I'd say, even uh, more broadly. Uh, and, uh, and you can show that there's actually an advantage in using these neural network representations, especially in, in terms of uh, uh, using uh, these, uh, these things to, to, to study these deep uh, circuits where you have a lot of entanglement. So for example, if you, if you compare the, the bond dimension, so the, the, the metric size that you need, uh, if you want to study the same circuits, but with an MTS, so again, this, uh, to, to, uh, this um, tensor network, uh, you can show that uh, if you want to reach the, the same um, uh, the same kind of accuracy, if you want on these on these circuits that uh, that one can get with these neural networks, you will need the bond dimension, which is around ten to the four or uh, in excess of ten to the four, which is uh, not very easy or very hard, I would say, at this point to, to reach uh, in uh, with, with actual MPS calculations. So you see that typically we have to stop here because essentially of, of memory issues. So, so this was just to, to also give another argument that using these uh, large highly entangled states is, is effective uh, uh, mostly, I would say, for, for, uh, for, for dynamics. So in this case, for, for unified dynamics used by a circuit, because it allows you to, to, to capture uh, entanglement also at the volume low level, even when you have a deep circuit or if you have a long time dynamics. Okay, so uh, I gave you a very broad uh, overview of, uh, of some of the applications that, uh, that we do of uh, um, these neural network states to, to simulate, if you want, uh, island-angle states uh, classically, uh, for example, for fermions or for dynamics, these circuits. Um, and I also gave you some, uh, some idea of what we do or we're trying to do in the case of variational quantum circuits, so in case where we use uh, um, quantum computers. These are potentially more expressive, but um, at this point in time, uh, this, uh, um, if you want the uh, expressivity is still to be demonstrated fully, uh, simply because we don't have large enough quantum computers. I mean, I believe that at some point we will, this will be demonstrated, but 
it's non-trivial to, to show that these kind of relational states are more expressive, for example, than, um, than classical states when, when it comes to finding ground states of, of Hamiltonians. Uh, we have some uh, limitations in both cases. So one main limitation that, uh, that uh, should be stated clearly is that um, uh, the, the main uh, difference, if you want respect to, to, if you want the standard approaches to the relational uh, methods is that in the case of neural networks, uh, the, the only guiding principle that we have are based, for example, on symmetries, but not too much on, on physics. Right? So we have, um, uh, if you want, a very general function that we are trying to, to use to represent wave functions, uh, but uh, we, we give up, if you want, uh, apart from, from physics, from, from the symmetries, um, uh, an insight in, uh, if you want, in understanding what's going on in the problem. Uh, but we, because in this sense, we just, um, this, this is largely to be compared to an experiment, a medical experiment that we perform to solve a given number of problems. So in this sense, it's normal that we give up, you have to give up something. Um, on the other hand, I mean, in the case of quantum, uh, of quantum simulators, as I was mentioning, the, 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 the drawback that they are, they are noisy. So at this point in time, we have to deal with that. Uh, and this means that we can also typically run only shallow circuits. So and those are, uh, you know, it's hard to claim that these are more expressive for this reason. These are hard, it's hard to claim that these are more expressive than, uh, than classical states, at least uh, at this point. In time. Okay, so thank you for, uh, for your attention. And uh, uh, if you have questions, uh, yeah, please just ask. Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe, for this uh, very nice uh, overview. Um, and the talk is now open for questions. Um, Anton, you go first. Um, thanks a lot. This was a uh, very interesting and informative. Um, but I think I think there was one aspect that I would still like to understand better. Uh, so you mentioned you so you explained quite clearly that uh, neural network states can represent more uh, more interesting wave functions than say matrix products or linear states. And I think that makes sense because, well, because these are, these have more parameters essentially. So uh, now as far as I understand, more parameters and a more complicated state also comes with a, uh, with like less guarantees. So, so uh, training should likely be harder. So is, is there any kind of systematic understanding about how training works? Right. So, 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 okay. So, so let me, okay. So, so I, I think it's not, uh, it's not about the number of parameters. So let, let me. Well, right. Sorry. Right. Yes. The, yeah. It is, it is a, a more flexible representation. Yeah, I understand. So the, the main difference is that one representation is a multilinear, uh, if you want to uh, think, and the other yep. one is nonlinear. So from nonlinearity typically comes a bit more flexibility, but uh, mm -hmm. you're perfectly right that with nonlinearity also come uh, more problems. So in the training, uh, typically. So for example, for MPS, uh, there are beautiful uh, training, if you want, uh, methods uh, that are based on uh, SVPs and other linear algebra tricks that can be used uh, essentially because these are multilinear uh, representations that you cannot use uh, for, for neural networks. I mean, at least uh, as far as we know. Right? So, uh, so in this sense, uh, the main um, thing that everybody does is using gradient descent. Whereas nobody would use, uh, or almost nobody would use gradient descent, for example, to train an MPS. Um, so yes, so in this sense, it's true that uh, trainability uh, is the main uh, bottleneck. This is clear. Um, uh, but um, for, for example, as I was mentioning in the case of, of the G1, G2 model, if you see matters, you can try to, to alleviate this bottleneck. So for example, if you don't use smartly I'd say symmetries, uh, your training will get stuck to some extent when energy, which is not as good as the DMRG in this specific case. However, if you use symmetries, you can, uh, you can do better. So we are, we are in the process uh, again uh, of, of learning how to <laughs> ourselves, how to optimize these things uh, in the best possible way. This is to, to a large extent uh, open. The, the, I'm not claiming that we have the the perfect uh, training uh, approach. All right. So just to see if I if I can if I caught the the overall situation correct, uh, there are now clear examples showing that 
uh, there are there are problems where others where, where uh, neural network states are performing better and are trainable but like whether it works in any specific situation is a matter of uh luck trying out and uh and uh whether and and just checking is that yeah, about I mean, right well i mean uh, i wouldn't think i wouldn't say it's a matter of luck of uh, i mean there is a structure and the principle the thing that you can do which is for example using symmetries using the right uh, optimizers so i'm claiming that if you use the right optimizer you use the right symmetries you, you, you get this so you get the lowest energies of, of the pack uh, the most accurate representation of the ground set because you are, you are using the, um, all of the insights that uh, have been matured in, in this field so far. Uh, but in general, uh, any variational technique, even a uh, tensor network or, whatever, or a quantum uh, circuit, um, is based on, on luck in the sense. In the sense yeah, yeah, luck. okay, yeah, fair. Mm -hmm. No guarantee a priori that I give you a Hamiltonian and you can find the ground state with that given answers. Yeah. So, in this sense, this is shared by all these variational methods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. All right, um, do we have more questions from the audience? Uh, I see um, one more. Ivet, please go ahead. Yeah, now that I have you on this slide. I was just wondering about the intuition for this, uh, or actually for the previous slide, for the phase transition behavior, yeah. sort of quote unquote phase transition behavior. Is, is the intuition here that you need this many samples because you want to filter out all of the nail and the ordered states? Like, um, is that, right? Do you see what I mean? That uh, yeah, yeah, you no, need this I, many I, samples I, to see to see that it's not nail, nail, and it's not ordered, but it's some mixture or something else. Uh, I think that this is the, the correct intuition in the sense that uh, I would expect that if I have a very simple ordered phase, in principle, I need one sample to learn it, right? So I just need to know right. that uh, everything is uh, not staggered or something like that. Uh, but but I have to say that uh, it's largely mysterious to me why there is a phase transition. I mean, I mean you can see this by eye that uh, is must be some sort of phase transition. Yeah? Um, agree, yeah. This is um, there are some insights from uh, from the statistical learning community, but yeah. uh, I would say this is fascinating at least uh, for me when, when you look at the ground states. This is one of the yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. But there's no. Is, do people think about some way of prioritized sampling here? Is there uh, some way of uh, rejecting samples if they're similar to what you've seen? Um, no, I think that this this has not been done. Uh, so if you want, yeah, one of the limitations of what we do so far is that we use, um, yeah, we just use uniform sampling from size square. You see here. Right. So we, right. we don't yeah. uh, put any prior if you want on the things that you've already seen. So maybe putting some bias in a sense and uh, removing some samples you already seen might help. That's a good point. Uh, but as far as I know, nobody has tried this. Great. Yeah. Thanks. OK, thank you. Um, Vladimir is next. Please go ahead. OK, hi, Giuseppe. Um, yeah, I was just wondering uh, about the same slide that Evert uh, was asking. Um, I, I was wondering because, for instance, in, in some reinforcement learning setups, um, like, for instance, if, if you have some machine that, that is trying to learn chess, um, they have some uh, also Monte Carlo tree search algorithms there. And I was just wondering uh, whether it would be a good idea to have some automatic um, truncation, like sample truncation shim. Uh, because I, I mean, for instance, in uh, one of the phases here in this, um, in this uh, system, but of course in other systems as well, such as the Bose Hubbard, um, you only need, well, it depends on the basis, but it, you only need uh, some very uh, specific set of samples to correctly describe, in this case, the ground state Whereas in the other phase, uh, you need quite uh, a lot of samples to describe correctly the, the ground state. So I, I was just wondering if uh, there has been any tries to 
implement those automatic um, truncation sample truncation schemes? Um, not that I that I know of, uh, but yeah, you're right that uh, a similar problem is faced when reinforcement learning because it's clear that to play Go you need more samples, so to speak, than to play I don't know uh, chess. Maybe I don't know. I, I suspect because yeah. Go it's a, it's a more complex game, right? So in this sense, yeah, the analogy would be that uh, Go is more complex than chess, and uh, you know the spin liquid is more complicated than than the um, the, the the order phase. But uh, uh, quantifying, if you want, this complexity is not easy, and I think this is one of the most uh, exciting, uh, if you want, open questions that are around there. Okay, thank you, Giuseppe. Okay, um, Joey. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, are there any kind of physical models or states where it's known that like the ground state has like a very nice compact uh, neural quantum state representation? Like in for matrix product states, you have like the ground states, the AKLT model and GHS states, which have like a which aren't product states, but have a very nice compact matrix product state representation. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the slide here anymore. But um, yes, so uh, all the states you mentioned that have, have a comp do have a compact uh, uh, neural network representations. There are papers on that. Okay. Um, so also the toric code, um, all the stabilizer states. Um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I would argue at this point that all these uh, all these uh, things here have. Uh, well, I don't know for the better answers, but I suppose yes. But I, I would say that essentially all these uh, states here have exact representations. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, on top of that, volume of states such as a stabilizer or you know, other things. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Do we have uh, more questions from the audience to Giuseppe? If not, maybe I can, I yeah, can I ask. Know. Say it again, Giuseppe. No, I think I run late a little bit with my with the time, but uh, yeah, sorry about that. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, it was very informative, as Anton already said. Uh, maybe I can ask one final uh, nasty question. Uh, if you go back to the slide with the beta ansatz and the BCS wave function, yeah, uh, this one, yeah, you mentioned or you pointed out that uh, there was basically one Nobel Prize, I guess, for each of them, or. I mean, yeah, I'm not it's related to Laughlin is the yeah. Laughlin involves the Jastro, so you can argue that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, what if you had to predict, like, if there's ever going to be a Nobel Prize for neural quantum states, what will be the, you know, paradigm shifting breakthrough that they have brought about? Or, uh, no, I mean, but, um, right, so, so, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the thing that, um, I, I, of course, uh, we want to do is, is doing physics, right? So mm -hmm. at the end, um, if there will ever be any you Nobel know, Prize, will be given to the, the application of this of these things. And I'm not saying this will happen. Actually, it's extremely unlikely that this will happen. But uh, but if, for example, you have some uh, system uh, that you don't know how to solve uh, with a different uh, approach, and you happen to use this one, uh, then uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's like that the guy will give who will get Nobel Prize is the guy who has uh, Applied the method, not the guy who has developed the method. Yeah. So this is historically true, for example, for even for uh, for DFT. Yeah. So DFT. Uh, so here, this guy, um, you know, he got the Nobel Prize not in physics but in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. By the fact that it was an extremely important method. So, um, but I think it's, it's you know to some extent. I mean, it's maybe questionable, but. but um, I would say, you know, historically applications uh, get, uh, get, get, get all physical insights, uh, get Nobel Prize, and this is maybe the way it should be. So we, we are just humble uh, people who, who want to, 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 to provide tools for, others people to, for other people to use, so we don't have this, uh, these ambitions, I would say. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, but uh, if you want the kind of problems you, you might want to, 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 to fish for, uh, for uh, new physics are, uh, are essentially, I would say, dynamics uh, of uh, correlated uh, two-dimensional systems, uh, 
uh, or uh, again quantum circuits, because you know why not? There's a lot of interesting stuff happening in quantum circuits, uh, also in the classical setting, if you want. Um, uh, dissipative uh, transitions, uh, you know, dissipative systems. Um, all of these are uh, potentially open questions, uh, or actually open questions where if you have a new technique, you can also find new physics. Um, so I think that this will come uh, hopefully in the future soon. Okay. Thanks uh, very much. That were, those were, I think, very nice uh, closing works words for the for the colloquium. So um, let's thank, uh, thank uh, Giuseppe again and uh, thank you everybody for for attending. And I will now stop the recording. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>